Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, Philippines Partnership for Sustainable Agriculture Working Groups Learning Series. Uh, this is the last part of the digital learning series organized um, in partnership with the League of Corporate Foundations or LCF. Uh, so during the yesterday event, which is the, the first part, we had uh, with us the chair of the League of Corporate uh, Foundations who are uh, join us for a multi-stakeholder collaboration uh, to drive the, digi the digitization of agriculture in the country. So before I officially start, uh, my name is uh, VJ, the Communications Manager of PPSA, and I will be your host for this afternoon session. Uh, but before we uh, proceed, uh, let me share our webinar rules. So we are recording this webinar and uh, we will make sure the recordings um, will be available on our YouTube channel and Spotify podcast. So make sure that you are, you know, uh, subscribe and uh, following our social media accounts. Um, your mic is automatically on mute, but we will give you permission to speak once we get into the open uh, forum part of the uh, webinar, if time permits. So just use the available raise hand function to call our attention and uh, wait to be acknowledged. Uh, should you have questions during the presentations, kindly type them in the Q&A box for better tracking of the questions. Uh, we will accommodate as many questions as we can during the moderator discussion and, of course, the Q&A. Um, and if you have any technical issues, you can use the chat box to ask for assistance. Or you can also try logging off and on again, or you can email uh, the PPSA Secretariat if this still doesn't work. So... All right, uh, I just want to give you a quick background about us, uh, especially for those who just came in for this session. Uh, PPSA or the Philippines Partnership for Sustainable Agriculture is a multi-stakeholder partnership platform for agriculture catalyzed by Grow Asia and the, and the Department of Agriculture. We are part of the Grow Asia Network, which is um, headquartered in Singapore and was catalyzed by the World Economic Forum and the ASEAN Secretariat. Uh, we work to convene uh, different stakeholders, especially those who are or that are operating along the agricultural value chain uh, to discuss various issues in agriculture and, of course, identify solutions for our smallholder farmers. Our setup is a public-private partnership one, so we have the Department of Agriculture led by Secretary William Dar as our co-chair to represent the public sector and Dr. Mary Ann Sayok of East West Seed to represent the public private sector. Um, we operate through our knowledge and learning work stream. For example, the one you are attending right now, uh, secretariat level initiatives, and through our working groups that are uh, either commodity-based or cross-cutting. So we have uh, working groups on coconut, coffee, corn, fisheries, and vegetables. And we have the cross-cutting issues, which include agricultural finance and learning alliance. We hope uh, to establish additional three working groups this year that you can, uh, of course, um, join in, such as Rice, Fruits, and the Digital Working Group. And for the past years, we have reached more than um, 110,000 smallholder farmers across the country uh, through our uh, partnerships and uh, through the value chain projects of our members and partners. So uh, that's... Uh, a brief uh, information about us. If you want to explore partnership with us, just connect with us through our email address and uh, or visit our website for more information. So now I'm calling on uh, Weili, the lead of innovation in Grow Asia, for a brief overview of the digital program being implemented at the regional level. Thanks so much, Over to you, Weili. Thank you. Yeah, as Vijay mentioned, uh, I'm the innovation lead at Grow Asia based in Singapore, and um, I'm responsible for our digital program, which includes the activities you see um, listed there. Um, our aim is really to build a digital agriculture community of practice in the region to help increase the impact that agri-tech solutions can have on, on smallholder farmers uh, all over the region. Uh, in the interest of time, I, I won't run through all of the programs, but it includes things like our digital learning series, which is quarterly and virtual now, and various like guides and reports that we have released over the past few years on topics like farmer digital adoption and smallholder agri-tech business models. Um, we also have a digital directory that we are in the process of, uh, or going to start the process soon of, of updating and uh, bringing more startups uh, 
on board. And I just wanted to highlight uh, some ways that you can keep in touch with us. So you can join our LinkedIn group, the Smallholder Agritech Southeast Asia LinkedIn group by scanning the QR code. And of course, if you would um, like to be involved specifically in any way or explore collaboration, you can contact PPSA. Uh, I think BJ put the um, link in, in the slides uh, to come. And also, you can also go to our website to sign up to receive our newsletters and uh, information about digital events uh, happening at the regional level. Uh, and I will put that link in the chat now. Thanks so much, Vijay. Back to you. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Bailey, for that. So now that you have learned the uh, overview about us and the work that uh, Grow Asia has been doing in the digital program, of course, we want to know you as well. So there's a poll that's going to um, appear on your screen, and I want you to choose from among the options on which organization you are representing or affiliated with. So this is for us to know the dynamics of the uh, room uh, today. So I'm giving you around 10 to 15 uh, seconds to uh, select uh, which sector uh, you are from. All right. So I'm just waiting for 80 to 85%. Oh, I think, oh, okay. Yeah, I think that's fine. So as you can see um, in the result of the poll, we have of course, a lot from uh, digital and technology-based companies because, you know, this is a digital uh, learning series. We also have uh, from the other private sector and we also have from the NGOs, CSOs, and academia, and of course, uh, government. And of course, we also have representation from farmer groups and cooperatives. So I think... Um, this is a great, uh, good mix of participants. So we are expecting different uh, perspectives and uh, questions during the Q&A and uh, the open forum if, if again, time permits. So uh, thank you for uh, your uh, participation. So now without further ado, we will now go to the first part of our, of our webinar session. So after our two speakers here have presented, we will have a question and answer session. Uh, with them. So if you have any questions at any point in the presentation, uh, you may use the Q&A box to send them to us and we will ask our speakers to respond to your questions. So, all right. Um, okay. So, uh, well, as you know, uh, infrastructure, innovation, you know, and other uh, components are significant in achieving a digitized agriculture. And we are uh, fortunate uh, to have here the representative of the Department of Information and uh, Communications Technology, uh, the lead uh, government agency in planning and implementing uh, the programs in anything and everything uh, ICT in the Philippines. So to give us what the department has been doing, we invited here Director Antonio Padre. Um, he was appointed as a Director in the Information and Communications Technology Office under the Department of Science and Technology in 2015 and following a number of I uh, I mean, OIC regional director roles. He was designated OIC director three of the Government Digital Transformation Bureau in September uh, 2020, as well as becoming the project director of the National Government Portal. Uh, Mr. Padre here uh, earned his electronics and communications engineering degree from St. Louis University in 1988, and he obtained his uh, license and as an electronics and communications engineer um, in the next year. So he also completed a master's in business administration at the International Academy of Management and Economics. So without uh, further ado, I'm now giving the mic to uh, Director Antonio. Over to you, Pa. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I'm representing the Department of Information and Communications Technology. And uh, the DICT, especially give its heartfelt thanks for the invitation uh, to this uh, uh, in, uh, event. So can we go to the next slide, please? So we'll be talking about uh, 
the views of the department on uh, the digital Philippines, a brief on the national broadband plan and uh, the government networks is spread all over the world. So all over the country. So this is how we look and how to develop the the Philippines moving into the uh, digital world. So as we all know, uh, we are leading the development on the national and local government levels, uh, working on the e governance plat e governance platform. So uh, these are the six or five major uh, programs that we are working with the whole of government, uh, working on digital standards, security, uh, flipping the digital knowledge of uh, the government workforce, uh, promoting or establishing digital connectivity, as well as uh, working with uh, all stakeholders on digital access uh, it could be on uh, through laptops, desktops, or on smartphones. Next slide, please. So on digital governance, uh, of course, uh, the government has to be on uh, the electronic governance. Uh, without it, we cannot deliver efficiency. We cannot improve efficiency. We cannot deliver as fast as the public, general public uh, wants us to, wants government to be. So we have several major programs on uh, working with uh, the national and local government levels. So for the local government, we have the electronic business permits and licensing system that uh, shortens the process of uh, the permitting and licensing at the local government from six steps to three steps and from seven uh, days to if the documentary requirements are complete to 30 minute processing. At the national level, we have established already the uh, central business portal for the business uh, entities to register process everything from registration to the operational requirements, as well as renewal of uh, the business licenses and permitting. This, uh, this uh, all, all the li agencies who are tasked to work on the permitting and licensing and accreditation are linked in this uh, central business portal that has also the Philippine uh, data, business database where all the the companies working on uh, the business side of uh, the economy are already in accommodated doing. And then of course, we are working on uh, the e-government master plan, uh, which is about to be, we are working on the version 2.0 now, but uh, toward the end of the year, we'll be inviting all the stakeholders, uh, the government, as well as the public sector, the non-government uh, organizations to help us uh, uh, improve this for toward the government master plan 3.0. Next slide, please. So on the educational side, uh, even before the pandemic came into our lives, uh, we've been working with the Department of Education and the Commission on Higher Education for the evolution of uh, the classrooms to incorporate digital uh, devices and services. Uh, recently, we've just uh, procured the learn learning uh, modules for the, the professors and teachers to work on so that the needed online educational materials for which the students can access will be made available. Uh, will be more efficient and will be more interactive. Uh, we are also improving the network connectivity of the schools since uh, we all know that we are now, uh, the mobile communications is now more, more migrating to 5G. Next slide, please. For the digital workforce, uh, we all know that, especially in the Philippines, uh, we are tech savvy, however, that's uh, predominant, predominantly for the millennials. 
And for those who are in the upper age bracket and uh, in the governance, so we have to improve the digital competency and literacy of the workforce, both in the national and the, the local go uh, government levels. That's why the Department of ICT has established the ICT Academy. And uh, it's been uh, functioning for, since last year. Uh, prior to pandemic, I believe, 1990, last uh, quarter of 2019. And uh, we have already ac uh, accommodated several private partnerships using this platform. Uh, so if ever PPSA or its uh, uh, major stakeholders want to share their educational materials online or conduct uh, virtual uh, sessions online, the ICT Academy can be contacted. And uh, you can use the facilities there in our training facility, or you can conduct virtual sessions to the prospective participants. Next slide, please. So uh, we have already around 4,000 digital workplace is spread all over the country. 60% uh, is being hosted by local government units. Some around 8% uh, are co-located with uh, the Department of Agriculture's uh, former IT systems or kits. And we welcome everyone to use these facilities free of charge. We just, uh, one has just to contact the center manager for them to have their schedules to, uh, to use the facilities there uh, with ample connectivity uh, devices like laptops and uh, tablets and some uh, e-learning modules. In fact, this digital workplace, or we call it now digital transformation centers are already hosting the mobile agri or m agri of the department of agriculture and we hope that some of our colleagues or some of the companies in the uh, who who are invited in the panel will uh, also share with the public especially the farmers their services and their programs here in this uh, facility of the department of ict next slide please so uh, we are also working on digital communities, focusing on improving the literacy, computer literacy of uh, the community members. Uh, we, uh, prior to the pandemic, we move around the, 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 the communities to conduct. However, due to the travel requirements, uh, traveling uh, difficulties that we have facing with the quarantine requirements, we have moved to digital, uh, to virtual uh, sessions with several communities now. Uh, we are close to around uh, 100,000 individuals uh, who went through uh, virtual sessions using, uh, working on ICT tools and applications. Uh, these are uh, hosted up to the lowest level of the local government. Uh, we have also mobile facilities that can be transported from one community to the other so that they can be accessed or used by the community folks for the virtual sessions the department or our partners wish to share it with them uh, we want uh, to enter into we welcome uh, stakeholders especially in the private sector if they can uh, share with us or uh, their services so that we can partner in bringing this uh, uh, electronic uh, programs closer to the communities. Next slide, please. So thank you very much uh, for the invitation and for listening to me for the past few minutes. Okay, uh, thank you so much, po, uh, Director Padre, for that uh, very brief but, uh, you know, um, comprehensive um, uh, presentation on the programs of the DICT. And we know the 
we learned about the ICT Academy, for example, that uh, has been the initiative of the DICT in uh, pushing for a digital literate and, of course, um, connected uh, sectors in the Philippines. So thank you so much for that. And again, to our uh, all our participants, we are inviting all of you uh, to uh, send your questions using the Q&A for Q&A box, and then we will ask uh, Director Antonio to respond to them uh, right after the second presenter. All right. So we're now going to the uh, second our second speaker for today. So our uh, second speaker is uh, Miss uh, Dory Armada, who has been with the DOST Picard since 1985, starting as the Science Research Specialist One, and rose from the ranks to become the Supervising Re Science Research Specialist in the Agricultural Resources Management Research Division of uh, Picard. She acted as the officer in charge of the division for almost two years, and she handled and led various programs and projects um, in Picard, such as acting as the national coordinator for the management of Asia Land Sloping Lands Project, funded by the Swiss Agency for Development Cooperation. She has published several articles and publications, mostly on land and water resources management. Uh, Ms. Dory earned her agriculture major in animal science degree from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. Uh, with that, over to you, Ms. Dory. Mom Dory. Mom Dory, I think there's a, a, a little bit of problem with your audio, ma'am. Um, still the same, ma'am. If it's okay, if we can, um, if you can try um, disconnecting the microphone and then connecting it again. Or if we, if okay with you, we will move your presentation to the um, to the next um, part, ma'am, and we will proceed with the question and answer for Dr. Pat, Director Patre. BJ, let's proceed first. Is it Q&A on my part, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. BJ, are you there? Let me proceed, sir, first. Um, I see in the Q&A box that there, uh, you answered the question on the... Um, the plans of the ICT on the last mile. Would you like to, sir, um, share about your um, response so that the others can um, hear it? Uh, yeah, yes, thank you very much for that question. Uh, for the last mile, on the part of the national and local government requirement, the department uh, is uh, embarking on a nationwide national broadband plan that will uh, provide the oper operational uh, internet requirement of, of all agencies and instrumentalities, including the local government units down to the uh, community level. On the commercial side, the National Telecommunications Commission, which is an attached agency of the Department of ICT, is uh, really working with all, all uh, providers, uh, telcos and ICT internet service providers to improve the connectivity and the services and the, the infrastructure going to the uh, countryside. In fact, uh, the department is engaging and uh, managed internet service 
to provide internet connectivity to the go uh, geographically isolated and disadvantaged uh, areas or GDA, uh, the first phase of which uh, will involve the provisioning of visa internet connectivity to uh, 1,035 uh, barangays in the far-flung areas of the Philippines. And uh, we've already submitted our budgetary proposals to both the Congresses. And uh, I think DBM is working on the issuance of the related funding for the next phases of this uh, internet connectivity provision to the far flung areas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul Director, for that uh, response. Apologies, I'm, I was away uh, from, my key, from my keyboard earlier. So uh, we have uh, questions that uh, were sent uh, by our participants in advance. So I think we have uh, two questions here. So first question po is, um, where are we in the digital uh, plan or digital landscape or digital strategy of the Philippine government in the Philippines? What's the current situation po of the digital landscape in the country? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, thank you for that, uh, sir. As I mentioned during the presentation, uh, we are we work and we are still working with the whole of government on the e-government master plan. Uh, this this calls for the digitization of the whole of government. Uh, of course, there are hindrances here and there, but uh, basically, especially during this pandemic, uh, almost everyone is uh, synonymous in saying that the government has to migrate to the digital governance. That's why uh, all governments now are asking the Department of ICT to evaluate and approve their ISSPs because if it, this is the requirement of the, the medium-term IT city harmonization initiative of Department of Budget and Management in such that all ICT projects of the government, national government, has to be, to be approved by the department prior to funding. We are now lodged with request for the approval of the, their respective ISSPs up to the provincial level of the national government agencies. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are about to update the e-government master plan 2.0 to the third uh, edition. And we will be inviting everyone, uh, even the, including the private sector to participate in the public uh, discussions on how to uh, update this uh, master plan in tune with the developments in the ICT. And we are looking at the uh, uh, suggestions on how to also incorporate the uh, Internet of Things and blockchain technology in uh, governance. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, one question po is um, who can enter in the ICT Academy and how? And the, the ac accreditation process is, I think, in the website. The ICT Academy is being managed by the ICT Competency and Literacy Development Bureau, or ILCDB, which is being headed by Assistant Secretary Alvin Navarro at the moment. So you can email, you can uh, write a letter request to the secretary, Secretary Gregorio Bionasan II, uh, uh, submitting the a letter of intent or the intention to engaged in the services of the ICT Academy. I believe the services available in the Academy is available online, uh, but we welcome proposals from, uh, especially in the private, from the private sector. If you need, if there is a need but for the private sector to introduce newer and more updated electronic agricultural uh, programs and systems. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, sir. And one last thing, may uh, humabol na question from our one of our participants. So, uh, what's the initiative to of uh, the DICT in terms of uh, sectors? So, so, for example, agriculture. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, 
we focus on working with the, the industry sectors, it would be very hard for us if we work an individual national government agency. So right now we are working with the uh, justice sector in coming up with their uh, national justice information system. All stakeholders are participating in that. We are also working with the Department of Transportation in their unified uh, transport management system. We are awaiting for department, the Department of Agriculture if they wish to propose an, an agriculture industry uh, information system or whatever could be more appropriately done to aid our farmers and fisher folks in addressing the requirements for a more efficient delivery of the government service to the, the farmers and the fisher folks and other particip uh, workforce in the in the agricultural industry, sir. Okay, so uh, thank you so much, for Director Padre. That's, I yeah. think, the, the last questions that we have. So uh, if anyone of our, in our, on, uh, among our participants who would like to ask other questions to um, Director Padre, uh, just um, uh, type in your questions uh, in the Q&A uh, box, and then we will ask um, Director Padre to respond to them um, uh, later on. So again, thank you so much. For, uh, yes, uh, uh, in parting, uh, may I request the Secretariat if ever, because in the interest of time, we, we may not be able to accommodate and answer all the okay. questions. Can you please collect the questions and uh, send me through email so that I can properly respond to? Thank you yes, very much. Yes, sir. That's uh, the, a, a very good suggestion. Bo. And again, uh, if you have any questions uh, uh, for uh, Director Antonio, uh, we will uh, collect them and we will uh, send uh, all of them to our to the director. So thank, thank you. you so much for again, uh, Director Antonio, for that uh, presentation and for responding to the questions of our participants. So now um, I'm go we're going back to uh, Ms. Dori Armada. Ma'am, can we try your audio again? Okay. Um, Ma'am, I think the situation of uh, audio is uh, still uh, persisting. So I'm, so I'm not sure how can we help? Ma'am, um, have you tried logging in and out of the Zoom? Uh, Ms. Dory, can you uh, log off and log on again to this uh, okay. webinar room? So, okay. Uh, apologies for the, to our uh, participants. So, we will uh, be moving uh, first to the uh, second part of our uh, session, and then we will get back to uh, Ms. Dory for uh, her presentation about the initiatives and uh, programs of the OSTP card. So uh, moving on uh, for uh, the next session uh, or the next part of the session, uh, we will ask our speakers to uh, present uh, their deck or their talking points uh, around eight to 10 minutes. And after uh, all our speakers have presented, there will be a moderated discussion and Q&A with them. So I'll be uh, going first with... Um, uh, Alice, uh, she's the director, uh, regional director, sorry, for Asia, Southeast Asia at Viamo. It's a global social enterprise dedicated to helping organizations harness ICT for large scale, high impact development projects. Alice has been with Viamo for four years, designing and implementing ICT solutions to solve information gaps, including increasing farmers' access to crop information and linking smallholder farmers with markets across Asia. Before joining Biamo, she worked in uh, international agricultural development in Asia and Africa. And Alice holds a master's in agricultural economics. With that, um, over to you, Alice. Thank you, Vijay, for that introduction. So hi everyone, I'm Elise, and I'll be speaking to you today about Viamo's experience in agriculture. 
so to get started, who is Viamo? Uh, so on the next slide, Viamo is short for Via Mobile. We believe information is power and we improve lives by providing and both gathering critical information via mobile phones. We work across both simple and smartphones to make sure it's accessible to all. So Viamo is the largest development focused mobile communication service provider. We are in over 36 countries throughout Africa and Asia. In Southeast Asia, we have offices in Indonesia, Cambodia, Myanmar, and we're starting offices in the Philippines and Vietnam currently. So what we do, we help our partners to design and implement mobile based behavior change communications remote training for field staff and feedback mechanisms to gather information uh, to make sure that we're having meaningful engagements with the users that we're trying to, to have an impact with and the organizations that are serving them. So if we look at agriculture on the next slide and Viamo's work in agriculture space, so we found that there's three main areas that Viamo can have impact on increasing information, um, especially extension information. The second is increasing access to markets for smallholder farmers. And the third is access to finance. And across all three of these areas, we always wanna make sure that we keep the individual farmer in mind. So we take a very human-centered design approach and we want to make sure that we're, we're looking at how do they use their phones? How do they interact with them? Do they have basic phones? Do they have smartphones? Can they use data? So a lot of the interactions that we, we use with them are leveraging platforms that they already use. So if they use Facebook, if they use WhatsApp, we can design a chat bot for them. If they're only using their phones to make phone calls or send SMS, we can also reach them that way. So a lot of the work we do is using IVR, which is all pre-recorded voice messages in local languages. So we can also work across different languages barriers as well. And then they just use their keypad to respond. So if we ask a question or if we have a series of listen and choose options for them to get to specific information, they just respond to it by using their keypad. For example, it can be press one for rice, press two for maize, and so on. So if we go specifically then and start looking at our in extension services, um, we can design these in very different ways, depending on the needs of the end user that we're looking at. So a lot of what we do is push campaigns where we'll call people with those voice-based messages which makes it very easy for the farmer. They only have to pick up their phone and listen to the message and maybe interact with it and answer a couple of questions. We can also then set up hotlines where they can call in and pull information on demand. Of course, this is nice because we don't always know exactly what information a farmer needs. We might not know their specific needs in their field at that moment, so if we push out information to them, it might be difficult to, to know their needs and make sure we send the right information uh, at that specific moment. But if it's on demand and they can call in and access it, then they have a wealth of information available to them. One of our main hotlines that Viamo started is called the 321 service. In the 321 service, what we do is create a, a relationship with a telco partner and we convinced the telco partner to cover the variable cost of airtime. So this makes it available at scale, but also sustainable. Uh, so we don't have to rely on donor funding or on the private sector to keep putting funds in for that or put that cost onto the end users, which might uh, limit who can access the service, whether or not they can afford it. So that's been a really great tool that we've been able to to replicate in over 19 markets. Currently, we have it in Indonesia and in Cambodia for Southeast Asia, and we'll be working on creating that service in the Philippines as well. So then if we look at access to markets on the next slide, 
we of course know that farmers, as they increase their yields, they need markets to sell those increased um, products at. So we started looking, we started this in Nepal on how can we use IVR and use low tech to connect farmers with markets. So we used the 321 service and started asking questions, asking farmers, asking buyers different questions on what products do they have, their location, price information, and then connecting them. So once we make a match, we then send an SMS to the farmer with the phone numbers of the buyers. The farmer can then call them, they can have those negotiations, they can find out more information, they can arrange the transport and the pickup, and hopefully in the end, they're able to sell more and for a higher price. This is what we found for in the Nepal case, that both the farmers and the buyers reported larger income from using the service. So we wanted to see, will this work in other countries and for other value chains? So we have now launched the service in Niger, Rwanda, and Indonesia, um, and are hoping to be launching it in the Philippines as well soon. Then the last one is access to finance. So we also want to be making sure that farmers have information on access to finance, that they know about loans, about savings, about insurance, and that they're also connected to the providers that have those services available. So we've done a lot of different mobile curriculums where we teach farmers about these different concepts. And then we can even embed a certificate through an SMS, which they can then show with a, a partner provider and show that they're now more bankable and a little bit more de-risked because they've successfully gone through this curriculum. We've also done choose your own adventure games where we put people in a story and let them choose what they would do in different scenarios. And this has proven to be a really great way to look more at the long-term horizon and get out of just short-term planning and what, what will affect the long-term, how do, can they have the best in the long-term um, and looking at that. So it's really helped with insurance especially um, as well as savings programs. So on the next slide, how it works. Um, so Viamo, we're really, we're this provider of an avenue to send information or to gather information. So we're not a technical expert. We're not technical experts in agriculture. Um, so we really work with partners, both pu public and private, to see what information do they have that needs to be sent? What information do they need to better plan programs, plan services, uh, and gather that information from the farmers? So we, it's a very collaborative way of working. And then the, the last partner, of course, that we really work on or with um, is the telecoms. So we need to make sure we have that local infrastructure in place um, to be able to make phone calls and have those reliable routes to connect between people and the organizations that are serving them. And then also to create those partnerships like the 321 service, where it has um, better rates that we're able to leverage and make sure that these programs are available at scale and sustainable. So if we look specifically at the Philippines, we are currently hiring a country manager. So the Philippines is a new country for us. We've done a couple of projects remotely um, from outside of the Philippines, but we really want to start a office there and grow our presence. So we are also at the same time, we're building up our partnerships, building up our networks. So please feel free to reach out to me directly. Uh, if you would like to connect and talk about how we can help in the Philippines. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that, Alice. And uh, yeah, uh, for our participants, just take note of the uh, opportunities uh, that uh, Viamo uh, 
uh, presented with us here and of course the country manager position. So of course uh, for this uh, session because of some technical issues we will be continuing first with the second part of the session and then after the Q&A with our speakers we will invite our speaker again from uh, DOST Picard. So uh, you know the drill um, if you have any questions uh, to our uh, speakers kindly kindly uh, type them in the Q&A box and we will uh, let them, uh, we will let our speakers respond to them uh, later on. So moving on, our next speaker is uh, uh, Pratip, uh, who is the CEO and co-founder of uh, Satchur. Over to you, Pratip. Thank you. So I'll just start sharing my screen. Uh, are you able to see my screen, Vijay? Yes, yes. Great. Well, <laughs> hello everyone. Uh, my name is Pratip Basu and uh, I'll be uh, discussing about what uh, we at Satsha uh, are uh, doing in terms of digital agriculture and also what we could potentially do in Philippines. So let me first give a quick uh, background of uh, the term decision intelligence, uh, the one you see on, on my uh, screen. Satsure as a company was uh, started in 2017 and uh, we were uh, all coming from space technology background. However, our intent was to not just push more and more analysis of space data, but to understand how it can be consumed easily by different stakeholders. So decision intelligence comes from the approach of uh, decision intelligence comes from that perspective. How do you take cultural context, management science, artificial intelligence, combine them together to create proper decision making points through different uh, sources. So at Satshore, what we have been uh, doing is and essentially uh, working across the entire data value chain. Data value chain meaning collection of the data collection of satellite images, weather data, collection of uh, data from mobile apps, from uh, through partners, uh, through our own apps, uh, which, which our clients are using, uh, pipe from customers, and then bringing all of that into cloud-based platform uh, to manage, effectively manage and store the data, and not just do that, but also then analyze so much amount of data to create insights, and then deliver those insights through embedded software platforms such as dashboards and uh, uh, mobile applications. So this, all of this sounds great, but exactly what we are doing, right? So we are working across three sectors, as we call it, agriculture, infrastructure, and climate change. So we have three product offerings, such as Sage, Kaizen, such as Sparta respectively, where we are essentially providing uh, our clients with information like what's the credit risk at a farm level uh, how much crop is damaged uh, uh, due to some typhoon or, or any kind of flooding and we do this remotely remotely meaning uh, all we need is a digital uh, signature of the farm and we are able to then run different machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms on satellite different kinds of satellite images uh, which is then verified also through the images captured from the phone. So you have multiple layers of data coming in and creating a decision point of how much how much is the crop, uh, what whether there is a drought, what's the damage to crops, quality of uh, water, surface availability of surface water, things like this. But they are all packaged in different, which I'll come to later. So as a company for our work, we have been recognized uh, by multiple uh, reputed global agencies such as the Asian Development Bank, uh, World Bank, Melinda Gates Foundation, and we are also one of the global editors uh, at World Economic Forum. And until until now, we have enabled almost 2 million farm loans across different geographies. Uh, we have pro uh, helped in uh, claim settlement of almost 400,000 farm, farm insurance. And we also started working in Philippines from last year. I would like to thank uh, his Excellency Dr. William Dar for providing us this opportunity where we piloted with Department of Agriculture and with the Philippines Crop Insurance Company for uh, uh, change, transforming uh, local crop insurance products that, for rice and corn for Filipino farmers. So all of this information that I mentioned, crop damage, credit risk, all of these are packaged uh, in different formats. Now how, how that works is we are doing 
nothing but creating a digital twin of agriculture. Digital twin of agriculture means that uh, in the digital space, we are essentially modeling each and every aspect of uh, uh, crop growth, uh, crop growth and crop characteristics remotely using artificial intelligence applied on weather and uh, uh, satellite imagery. How, what it does is it helps us to contextualize uh, risk at every point. It helps us to also uh, provide the necessary inputs for crop simulation and cro empirical crop models to be uh, you know converted into advisories for farmers uh, we are providing this information not only at a regional level we are provide or, or regional as in barangay or municipality level but we are providing it at a farm level and then we empower our uh, our users to also provide feedback through our mo mobile application through which the, we are also digitizing these lands so all of this tech at the back end actually goes and impacts people. For example, uh, you know, we work in Myanmar as well and uh, uh, we work with microfinance agencies who are linked to farmers such as uh, this lady uh, example uh, who, who are not having their papers, uh, land papers for all the land they hold and it inhibits the capacity to you know, invest in their farm and uh, how do you assess the risk of uh, default for, for a uh, bank? Right. So it works in uh, different ways. Some people are providing services to farmers. We are providing services to organizations who, who uh, work with farmers. So that's where uh, uh, these kind of uh, tools come into picture. And uh, uh, as I said, uh, we are empowering such, uh, such kind of organizations by co continuously contextualizing these uh, information that we uh, map from the satellites. How do we do that? This is uh, more interesting because we are essentially using the properties uh, uh, of, of, of plants and how they reflect in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum to, to essentially model the, these crops uh, remotely meaning that how can one say sitting in India or, or Switzerland uh, what is uh, what is farmer A growing in Philippines we can because we are we have today been able to uh, scale this kind of work across seven different countries uh, servicing like almost uh, more 50 million farmers indirectly. So simple, simple things like identification of customers, onboarding of customers, assessing their risk, monitoring the farms or monitoring the loans or insurance, uh, processing the claims faster, process, uh, doing the collections faster, all of these kind of business uh, processes uh, are improved which helps in improving the customer experience customer in this case is the farmer one example of the flood assessment is uh, uh, just from uh, one part of india where we had uh, again landfall of cyclone and uh, as you can see here in the image we are identifying the inundation areas we we have already identified uh, the crop how much crop area is there which crop is it and how what crop stage it is and then r immediately we are able to say and this all happens within like uh, a couple of days exactly how much area has been damaged and which areas have been damaged you can pinpoint and say which farms have been damaged so all of this helps uh, uh, our customers and their customers which is farmers to to improve their digital services uh, and also start contextualizing uh, uh, advisories and create and platformizing their services uh, to help the farmers you know uh, get better prices for their produce to help the farmers get better offers on loans and insurance uh, and uh, all of this uh, today is culminating into Satyal's own uh, satellite constellation called Satyal Argus. The first satellite is uh, scheduled to fly from 2022 and uh, what it will make is that today we have built the software we have today we are uh, continuously improving on on the uh, on, on the uh, customizations for different different countries like in Philippines we have done so many changes for our products we would be able to offer our clients uh, information on uh, uh, on demand where we are uh, for example if there is a disaster we can immediately process some of the data at the satellite itself and uh, then directly uh, uh, provide the the insight without having to go through the do download of the image at a ground station and then coming back so what I would like to highlight as part of the series is that satellites are a key part of 
digital technologies and they are very key for sustainability. Indeed, in the last report uh, by uh, His Excellency President Duterte, uh, he mentioned about uh, the, the um, intent of the Philippines government to, to adopt more and more satellite technologies and also quoted uh, our work with uh, the uh, Planters Product Produce Inc. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's that's uh, we are looking at an exciting phase of digitization uh, in Philippines, and we look forward to partner with uh, with different organizations in the country to service Filipino farmers better. Thank you. This is our uh, short team, and uh, I'll be open to any questions. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Pratip, for that uh, comprehensive presentation and, of course, for uh, showing us your uh, technology in terms of, you know, uh, satellite and all other uh, technologies that you are have in such sure. So, uh, thank you so much for that again. And uh, for our participants, if you have uh, any questions, just um, Type them in the Q&A box and we will let our speakers uh, to respond to them uh, right after all the speakers have um, presented. Okay, so moving on to our uh, next speaker. Um, Felix is the president and uh, CEO of Comunidad. It's a tech company focusing on weather and natural disaster information solutions. And uh, Bulod Natural Spaces Incorporated, it's a, a social enterprise that aims to empower the livelihood of rural and indigenous communities. As agriculture is highly dependent on weather and climate, Comunidad developed insights and solutions to improve on-farm performance and safety um, increasing both administrators and farmers' understanding of weather and other critical data that impact their operations and production. Currently, their agriculture solutions are being used by farming communities in Cambodia, Vietnam, uh, Philippines, and agriculture companies in Sri Lanka. With that, over to you, Felix. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction, BJ. So, uh, yeah, um, what I'll be discussing is actually um, uh, about uh, weather intelligence in terms of, uh, you know, using it in the agriculture sector. So uh, just to add more to our company, well, Comunidad is a, a Filipino company. Uh, we are actually based in Bicol region in Elbay. Uh, and, uh, but we have uh, our global office in Singapore. So uh, we, we are actually a tech company, but only focusing on weather and natural disaster information services. So we serve a lot of sectors now in, uh, in Asia, in the Philippines, mostly in the local government, like the city of Taguig, the city of Tamnaluyong. So we are, uh, you know, we are providing them impact-based monitoring and forecasting systems for every barangay. Uh, we are also, uh, well, in the Philippines, we are visible also in the energy sector, uh, in the uh, producers, generators, uh, distributors, who so are also serving them with uh, a lot of data. And uh, for agriculture sector, we are, uh, you know, we, we serve a lot of, uh, we, we, we do uh, like uh, rubber plantations in India. We have uh, farming communities in Cambodia and also in Vietnam. So we do have a lot of projects in agriculture, but what I'll be showing you are some important data sets that we can use uh, to have an impact in terms of the safety and efficiency of agriculture operations, especially in the Philippines. Uh, those are the you know applications and data that can support the agriculture and are available in the Philippines, but uh, we're not utilizing it. So this is just mostly not about our company, but I just wanted to show you some data sets and applications that we use here in the Philippines uh, that can enable agriculture farms get 360 degree situational awareness, insights, uh, focusing on weather, environmental conditions, and natural disasters. Um, I was listening to Satchur. Uh, recently, uh, I mean the previous uh, what they call this uh, presentation, and uh, these are just these are the data, uh, the information that we need in order for us to help. You know, so but but I will be showing is uh, some data that we used in the Philippines. So uh, mostly we uh, there's uh, this called uh, uh, IBM. Well, IBM is already in uh, in the weather space. They bought the weather company, so they have a new model called uh, IBM Graph. So what 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 it does is it actually creates a mesh. Uh, with a four kilometer resolution, meaning uh, if you apply it in the Philippines, uh, every four kilometer mesh in the Philippines, we have uh, weather data. So this weather data, uh, because traditionally in the Philippines, we are using weather stations 
and uh, but there are remote areas like farm farms are in the remote areas you know we don't have any infrastructure so what ibm does uh, is they, they create a synthetic weather uh, observation so they create a synthetic version of the weather but how do they do it so since ibm has a, a supercomputer uh, now uh, they can they can really model a lot of data so data are coming from the existing weather stations that we have here uh, wmo weather stations uh, from satellites, from aircrafts, from balloons, and of course from from a community of weather stations. Example, weather underground, uh, because they already bought also weather underground. So they have lots of data inputs. That is why now they can create uh, weather from any part of the globe. In the Philippines, for example, um, the promise is every four kilometers. So imagine every four kilometers in the Philippines, we have weather data. So this will enable a lot of farmers, farms, you know, in a lot of communities to get uh, weather data, which for now, it's it's not yet possible. So now this is already available. Actually, we are using this in uh, local government for every barangay. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. Yeah, so uh, as mentioned, so they are the first ever operational global weather model to run on uh, GPU accelerated servers. So they have a lot of servers. They can they can do a lot of uh, modeling. So now that's that is why there's uh, we call synthetic weather data. So, uh, but now we, of course, traditionally we, we want weather station there, but there are cases where you cannot put a weather station, for example, um, uh, areas which does not have any internet, does not have any, you know, now it's, it's, uh, it's possible. It's better to have data rather than, you know, not, than, than nothing. Okay, next slide. So uh, this is also one data that we use. Uh, it's called the Earth Networks Pag-Asa Total Lighting Detection Network. So two years ago, uh, actually we, uh, I was also the one who, uh, who work on this project. So Pagasa installed a network of lighting sensors uh, all, all over the Philippines. So this is now used by Manila International Airport. But the purpose of that network is not just Manila Airport or Pagasa in Metro Manila. So it's all around the Philippines. So we did, with this network, uh, there's a detection efficiency of uh, lightning uh, up to 95% and zero to 100 meters uh, location accuracy. So what does this mean? So when you have this network, you can create derivative products, a lot of products like early detection of thunderstorm. Um, uh, we, they, they also created a derivative product called pulse radar, which uh, for locations that does that not have radar, radar is expensive. Farmers can already use that data as an alternative radar. These are for the sudden rain, uh, you know, dangerous thunderstorms. And of course, lightning. Uh, uh, I think in India last time, uh, there were, um, a lot of casualties uh, when uh, there was a lot of lightning strikes. So lightning strikes also uh, play a key, uh, it's very important, uh, you know, to, to know if uh, we have that kind of scenario to, to a lot of farmers. So now, uh, you know, as you can see in the previous slide, we have weather every four kilometers, and we also have these kinds of data like lightning and thunderstorms on, in every part of the Philippines. But of course, no one's just utilizing it in the agriculture sector yet. But uh, the reason for my presentation is to show these data sets that it can be used by a lot of agencies, not just us in Comunidad. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, but here uh, we also, uh, we deploy IoT sensors uh, in, uh, we call it, this is the first smart weather camera. So this is very small. Uh, you can deploy anywhere. You can move anywhere. You don't need an engineer actually to install it. Uh, you just need uh, internet connection. While internet connection are, is improving in the Philippines, we can, you know, we can just deploy these sensors. For now, we 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 have this 300, 300 plus sensors are deployed in Metro Manila. It's used by the local government. Uh, in Taguig, we had 156. We have 70 in uh, in Mandaluyong City, and we have hundreds of it uh, spread out in the Philippines, around 300 plus. So uh, we have a farm here. This is an example of uh, a farm that uh, that as a company we, we are supporting. Uh, it's in uh, Daraitan Tanay Rizal. So uh, we just, it's operated by solar power and uh, they just extended the signal from smart and, and you know, it's already operational. So uh, next slide, please. So with this uh, data plus the data of, uh, you know, you can model it to have accurate weather forecasting. So this is just an example of what we do at Comunidad. So this, for example, a farm. So you get, uh, you know, visualization, you get uh, synthetic weather, uh, you get now cast, which is, uh, you know, a six hour accurate assessment of rain, wind, you get 15 days weather, you get the severe weather, uh, you know, scenario, you also have, you know, weather related stuff, right, lifestyle. So, so with all this data input, you know, you combined with statistical model, you can already, you know, create this in any farm in the Philippines, actually within uh, 24 hours, you just pick a farm in the Philippines. You can already, uh, you know, have data sets, but along the way it, it improves. 
while you put more data sets, uh, like for example, what if we integrate to Satsure? You know, I think it's uh, it's going to be a best solution because you know from the statistical weather data and others. And what if we use Payamo for 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 example for for mobile mobile applications for farmers? I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do, but the important thing is you know we have the data available in the Philippines, but of course there's uh, not that much uh, you know talk about you know how to access this data. Is this data available? You know those kinds of things. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so with, with all this data, for example, you can create a lot of, uh, you know, uh, what they call this, uh, insights, uh, intelligence for every farm. So it can be uh, severe weather, it can be just, you know, what's the weather now, what's the weather in 15 days, or it can be seasonal, like six months. Uh, so there's a lot of things that you can do with all the data that we have. So imagine, you know, we, we all, all, is, all of this data is already available in the Philippines, but how come the agriculture sector is not utilizing it? Because we uh, we always look at it on a on a traditional perspective, right? But there's also a lot of information now that can be done. Uh, you know, for example, I have a farm. I, I tried it in farm in uh, Daraitan Tanay Rizal. You know, it's a very remote area managed by the Dumaga tribe. But now the Dumaga tribe has a you know has uh, AI machine learning stuff. So yeah, I mean those kinds of things. Uh, it it can be done. It can be done. And uh, yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, these are also some of the analysis reports that you can do. You can distribute it via SMS, via, via email. Uh, and this is also uh, the, the, the left part of the slide you see is a dangerous thunderstorm alert. So for example, if uh, the farmers are working in this area, uh, they can get SMS uh, an hour before there's a dangerous thunderstorm. The reason why you have this is similar to Manila International Airport, which Pagasa owns the data. Uh, but uh, what they call this, but in terms of distribution uh, and then the creation of applications, that's where our government is uh, I, I, not, not lacking, but uh, I think we need further more uh, be proactive in terms of developing applications. So uh, with, with the Pagasa network, you can already create this type of system. So every farmer now can have uh, an, an hour alert before a thunderstorm hits them or uh, you know, a proximity alert for lightning. So it's possible now uh, all over the Philippines. Uh, you just we just have to use that data. I mean, uh, um, for Comunidad, we empower uh, the communities to you know to make use of a lot of data. Well, some some are commercially available. There's uh, there's a fee for that, uh, which which of course the you know there's a lot of budget in government in funding. Um, I mean, there's a lot of it. And uh, the yeah the important part is yeah I'm just showing you the the data that we have now. Uh, next part next slide. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, sorry. Uh, so it's uh, that. That's just my, uh, you know, uh, our uh, presentation. So, what we wanted to really show is uh, the power of the data, uh, data sets that can cater to all the farms in the Philippines, from you know Luzon to Mindanao. In every like four kilometer uh, grid, you know, you can already serve. Uh, you know, the data is already available. Uh, mix of government data, public data, private uh, company data. So yeah, uh, everything is, uh, is, is available now. And then we have a lot of tech companies in the Philippines that can do that. You know, it, it, it can be your local IT, uh, IT in-house, or you, know, you can also uh, outsource it to us at Comunidad. So yeah, this is what we do in, uh, in Sri Lanka, in, uh, in, 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 in India. Uh, we have Assam State also in India, government, uh, which we also do uh, you know, uh, weather intelligence with a lot of data. For every country, we have uh, various data sets. But I just showed you some of the new data sets in the Philippines that we can use. Yeah, that's it. For any questions, just, you know, just uh, you, you, you can use the chat room here or you can send us an email here at uh, info at comunidad.co. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much uh, for that uh, presentation, Felix. So now that we have, uh, first we have the satellite. Uh, now we have a weather station. So we're now going to another uh, technology. So our next speaker is uh, JP Solis, uh, who is the founding CEO of Miami. Uh, it's the Philippines' fastest growing impact-driven farm-to-table platform empowering over 12,000 smallholder farmers by connecting them to over 10,000 B2C consumers and solid B2B brands such as Shell, Walter Mart, Ayala Foundation, UCC Group, and Healthy Options, among others. Uh, Mayani is also the sole ag e-commerce par partner of the Philippine Department and Trade and Industry for its National Grand Bagsakan Project. 
uh, armed with strong e-commerce experience, JP has driven revenue growth for Miami and has uh, catapulted it to, to rise above 31 countries as the global winner of the ADB hard hit economic sectors challenge in 2020, as well as one of the eight selected Southeast Asian tech startups chosen to be part of Cognity Labs. It's a Silicon Valley uh, based accelerator. Today, Mayani is now VC funded and is the first ever Philippine agri tech startup backed by Ag Founder. It's the world's uh, most reputable ag tech focused VC as part of its Grow 2021 cohort. With that, over to you, JT. Thanks a lot, uh, VJ, for that. You know, very, very wonderful introduction. You know, I've been looking at the other speakers like Pratip, Felix, and Alice, and I can already tell you, you know, there, there are lots of possible synergies that we can firm up uh, with those other uh, players. So it's it's an honor uh, to be here. Thanks, Whaley and and uh, PPSA and Amy for inviting me over. So I'd like to give my share of the story when it comes to Mayan and how we've been empowering a lot of the smaller farmers here in the Philippines. I saw in the previous presentation that uh, you know there's been a lot of focus when it comes to agriculture in the Philippines. Um, Felix, for instance, Alice is actually expanding the Philippines. Uh, Pratip is also forged a collaboration with DA here in the Philippines. So I, I feel like agriculture in the Philippines is really in a very, is at a crossroads, right? Um, we're currently at that point we're in. There's a lot of disruption happening. And we're very excited to be in this space because if you come to think about it, agri-food has the largest consumer base in the entire planet, right? And we're solving some of the most complex problems addressing the most common of a human need, such as agri-food. So we're Mayani and we're uplifting the lives of smaller farmers through, through technology. That's sort of our mission. Um, when we were starting out during our founding days, we encountered a farmer, a rice farmer with over 30 years and 40 years of experience as a rice farmer in Southern Luzon in Leon, Batangas. His name is Kaf Felix. And in our conversation with him, we've been encountering a lot of problems uh, whenever he wants to you know, harvest rice and actually wants to sell it, turn the crops into cash. The first one is he can't seem to find a good buyer, right? Um, he can't seem to find a ready buyer for his produce. But secondly, even if he does, those buyers aren't able, you know, are not willing to buy his fresh produce at a price that is enabling for Catholic to recover his cost of inputs and production. So this is this seems to be a huge problem in Philippine agriculture among smaller farmers. So we ask ourselves, is this a broader reflection of what's happening in the entire Philippine agriculture sector? And in our succeeding research and actually conversing and engaging a lot of the farmers on the ground, we actually saw that almost 10 million Filipino smallholder farmers actually have this huge responsibility on their shoulders to feed 110 Filipino nation and yet falling deeper into poverty. They're at the bottom of the pyramid, right? To the point that the Philippine Statistical Authority actually has articulated that our farmers are actually mostly self-employed, small, marginalized and belong to the country's poorest of the poor. So this is where we're coming from, right? And and you know, and this is where we got in touch with PPSA who's been and Grow Asia who's been empowering smallholder value chains in Asia. When we were trying to characterize the problem and provide the nuance to the problems here in the Philippines, we saw three core legs to that problem, that wicked problem, right? The first one is really a lack of a fair and broad market access to a lot of the farmers. We think in the Philippines for generations, you have an average of about six to seven layers of middlemen um, with majority of these middlemen, while not adding value to the entire supply chain, are actually financially gaining majority, taking on a lion's share of, of you know, the benefits there in the agri-supply chain. But the second thing that we would say is, and something that has also impacted consumers on the demand side is there's a very high transaction cost when it comes to moving fresh produce from the farmer to the market, right? And in doing so, actually, there's a high rate of, of food loss, right? In the Philippines, there was a, even a study of Benguet State University in, in Baguio uh, that it can even go as high as 67%, right? The global average is about 30%. 30% of the food that gets harvested actually gets wasted. That's the global average. In the Philippines, it can even go as high as 67%, more than twice the global average. And the third one 
is a very unreliable supply chain, something we've seen in the course of the pandemic. In the Philippines, we call it the enhanced community quarantine. We experienced some of the biggest, some of the hardest, some of the longest lockdowns in the world. Uh, we're in a lot of the rural farming activities actually came to a halt, a complete halt because of, of the lockdown, right? And so what we did was armed with this realities in terms of the problem, we came out with a solution, a digital platform solution that would directly connect smallholder farmers and consumers in a very seamless, in a very data-driven way. One, we're trying to address the fair and the broad market access problem by providing them unprecedented access to markets they otherwise haven't tapped and covered right, because of a digital platform. The second one, we are able to minimize transaction costs, meaning we drive higher farm gate prices, but that doesn't mean that we're driving higher co consumer costs. We're actually making it more competitive. And in the middle, because of higher efficiency in the supply chain, we're minimizing food loss, something that is critical for a nation that is growing, for a nation that is on a lockdown, and for a nation where you got a, lo a lot of urban poor right population. Third one is definitely making the supply chain more dependable and shock absorptive. We think that the future of a food system is a future we're in. It's more future proof, uh, it's more shock proof, and it's better able to adapt to the new normal, right? Meaning lesser intermediaries uh, in the agri supply chain, making it continuous despite all these external shocks that is happening right now. So in a lot of ways, we did spark a tech revolution here in the Philippines and disrupted the agri supply chain uh, for the better, right? Uh, when we talk about, for instance, like helping farmers, tomato growers, this cooperative in Quirino province all the way up in the north. When we talk about, for instance, helping the Formosa pineapples down in Bicol region, that's in Southern Luzon here in the Philippines. When we talk about helping even majority of our farmers who are focusing on non-value, non-high non -high value crops such as rice, right? Like 80% of the Philippines, Filipino farmers just focusing on low value crops like rice, even helping them side by side other like-minded partners in, and even garnering the support of the likes of USAID, DA and DTI for this Gulen and Binational Project, something we did at the height of the lockdown, April 2020 of last year, even ensuring that the agriculture in Batanes, the northernmost province there in the Philippines, up there in the north, to thrive amidst COVID-19, ensuring that they have continuous access to market and linkage to market, and even doing the first and only tripartite partnership of its kind with the Philippine Department of Trade and Grab Southeast Asia's leading super app, something that came out in, in E27. And a lot of these things, right? So all of these things have contributed to us being the leader in the agri e-commerce space here in the country, we're very proud to share that we now work with about 12,000 smallholder farmers across the country from as far as uh, Batanes all the way down to Palawan. Our B2C user base is 10,000 and we now power the agri supply chain. So the biggest multinational and reputable brands in the country, the likes of Shell, the likes of Ayala, the likes of Healthy Options, Walter Mart, one of the biggest supermarket chains in the country, even some of the biggest foundations and civic organizations that we have here, right? Um, but something that we've all always been conscious of is always been the social impact that we're driving by beyond the financial return. So our farmers who have been working with us have actually experienced a 50% rise in attributable incomes because they work directly with our farmers. So definitely something that demonstrates value creation into what we're doing. But what cemented our position in the agri e-commerce space is really when we rose above 31 countries and secured the backing of the Asian Development Bank, when they were looking for solutions that are able to shape the new normal rather than just adopt to it, we were able to get their support in scaling our impact here in the Philippines and hopefully in other ADB member developing countries, such as what we did, what they did in Ton Lesap in central Cambodia when, it, when they empowered a lot of the smaller farmers there. So a lot of these things, maybe just sort of put a face uh, to the farmers communities we work with, um, the Pililia Farmers in Rizal, these are the group of farmers we're helping in collaboration with Filipino Shell Foundation, Foundation, the social arm of Shell. Um, of course, working with small farm cooperatives in southern Luzon, like the MAFA, the Malorhatan Family Farm Association, and of course, in close ties with the Philippine Department of Trade, working with the 4,761 farmers that they have in Cagayan Valley region, what is considered as the food basket of Luzon. A lot of these things have firmed up and concretized our business model. It's actually very simple. Um, 
who is simply function as the agri-marketing and the order fulfillment platform for smaller farmers, particularly organized ones, cooperatives, as we sell and move their products to consumers, both retail and commercial, likes of Shell, likes of uh, UCC, right? The likes of Walmart, all those big commercial brands, right? We feel that apart from the premise that agri-food compared to other verticals, has the biggest consumer base in the entire planet. We think that from a Southeast Asia macro perspective, we're in a very, very good position and outlook right now. Um, as you may know, COVID has actually accelerated digital adoption by about four to six years. And in particular, the food delivery and e-commerce sectors in the economy, the digital economy of Southeast Asia are going very, very strong. And so a lot of, a lot of guys are very bullish and aggressive about this with about 44% year-on-year growth in food delivery and about 55% year-on-year growth in e-commerce, something that presents itself as a huge opportunity for us, for players like us, and for agriculture in general. Because of our massive traction, we have garnered and attracted the support of some of the biggest brands uh, all over the world and in the country to team up with us and actually sort of leverage the user base that we have, our infrastructure, and, and our thriving community, the likes of HSBC, the likes of Grab, the e-wallet of Southeast Asia's leading super app, uh, the likes of Kumu, a live streaming app here in the Philippines, and even huge multinational brands like Shell, Colgate, uh, even Universal, Rubina. But something that we're also keen in scaling up is this recent project that we got exclusively with the Department of Trade and Industry as their sole agri e-commerce platform partner called the Grand Bagsaka and something that we piloted at the height of the Philippines re-entry into a lockdown, right? Right that very week when the government declared um, enhanced community quarantine, we sought out, we took it, you know, we took it upon ourselves to actually provide that continuity in the agri supply chain in the Philippines when the capital was going back on ECQ. And at the same time, ensure that there's continuous livelihood on the part of smallholder farmers, especially those coming from the northern region. Um, all, of course, all of these things would have been possible without the global team. So these are sort of a global team right now, um, uh, all Filipino, uh, coming working from different parts of the world, Philippines, uh, Spain, and, and Singapore. And of course, we're also backed by some of the most passionate, some of the most experienced guests when it comes to our board of advisors, including, you know, Talal Rafi from, from the World Bank and ADB. Um, of course, a former secretary, Cito Lorenzo of the Department of Agriculture himself, some seasoned impact investors from Canada and Silicon Valley, um, even Steve Landman, a Silicon Valley technopreneur, did about 17 exits uh, as, an imp as a technopreneur, right? Um, also, in due recognition of our um, you know, strategic backer, especially early on during our early years, uh, I wouldn't have actually gotten to the PPSA Grow Asia platform had it not been for AgFunder. Uh, we're very proud to be the first and only Philippine agritech startup that they're backed here in the Philippines so far. Uh, and only the Philippine the only Philippine agritech startup that made it to this year's Grow Impact Accelerator out of Singapore, uh, backed by AgFunder. Uh, we're also backed by some family offices here in the Philippines and a key executive of IFC. Um, so that's what we've been doing and sort of the mission and the footprint that we have here in the Philippine space. Uh, I'd be more than happy to hear uh, from any one of you if you, you'd like to reach out and collaborate and bounce off some ideas. Um, my email is here. It's JT at Miami. .ph. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, JT, for that presentation. And of course, to our uh, previous speakers, Alice, uh, Pratif, and Felix, uh, for your presentations and for giving us uh, a quick background, a brief background about uh, the technology and your initiatives in uh, digitizing uh, the agriculture in the country. So now um, I'm inviting uh, our panelists here, uh, JT. Felix, Alice, and Patif uh, to um, join us with a with the uh, question and answer, and of course with the moderator discussion. And we have uh, here uh, three questions that every uh, panelist um, uh, may answer, and then we will read some questions from our participants that are that are directed specifically to one of uh, of our speakers. Uh, so first. Um, um, the question is, uh, what could the Philippines do, especially, you know, the private sector that has a lot of um, uh, assets and the capacity uh, to push for digitization of agriculture in the Philippines? So, 
uh, I mean, what's your recommendation and uh, some point of collaboration among the sectors across the agricultural landscape? So, um, anyone from our uh, four panelists uh, who could uh, answer that uh, first question? Okay, going once. <laughs> Sorry, I can uh, I can suggest. Um, actually, what we okay, do, sure. what we do is we create pilot projects uh, depending on uh, the requirement or if there's a need. Uh, let's say, for example, a certain farm in the Philippines, if there's uh, a problem that needs to solve, and uh, you know, gathering the requirements uh, is very important. And then, usually, uh, as as tech companies, you know, we can actually support mm -hmm. them by uh, creating a pilot project, you know, which does not have any commitment until it, uh, uh, you know goes to a point where you have to expand it and that's a time you can discuss like uh, you know what are the you know the fees related to this cause who will fund this but I think maybe a three to six month pilot project is uh, uh, for me in my opinion is the best approach that's a, that's what we do in in uh, other communities as well so from there uh, you determine if the solution is really fit and if you know that data is really fit to to, to the solution or, or whatever I think a pilot project would be uh, would be a great idea. Uh, to start. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Felix. Um, other speak, Alice, do you want yes. to respond? Okay. Just to, to add on to what Felix said. So that's, that's also what we do a lot with at Biamo with the private sector is to get a proof of concept um, by partnering with the private sector and doing a pilot, which then we can explore how to find funding to scale it and make it more sustainable at a large scale. Uh, I think the uh, the other thing is, since the private sector has a lot of contact with farmers and a lot of interaction with them, if they they can start helping with awareness raising of different platforms that do exist that can benefit the farmers that they're working with. So if they can start to help with some of, more of that awareness raising of these different platforms that are out there and help with that behavior change. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for that, Alice. I think um, agricultural finance or financing in general is uh, still really uh, very crucial in uh, you know in this um, undertaking. And uh, actually, in our uh, previous uh, sessions in on agricultural finance, that's uh, uh, the key issues that uh, our uh, audience and our speakers also raised about the issue on agricultural financing and of course the ac access of smallholder farmers uh, to these uh, oppor financing opportunities. All right, uh, do we have other speakers that can uh, respond to the question? Okay. Okay. So I, I'm going now to the uh, second question that we have here. So we all know that you know connectivity is still an issue, right? Uh, while uh, the internet while the internet penetration, especially in the Philippines, has you know I can say that has improved for the last uh, ten to fifteen years. But how can we push connectivity at the farm level, since most of the you know the technology presented here targets farmers or cooperatives? So um, the connect, how can we push connectivity? Uh, well, since uh, mostly uh, some of the focus group discussions that we did with uh, other government agencies, the connectivity is still an issue. And uh, you know, uh, we have here the, uh, of course, the Department of Information and Communications Technology, who is leading the the initiative. But how can, at your own. Uh, level or perspective, how can we push connectivity at the farm level? So I, I can jump in here. Um, okay. This is what Viama really focuses on is reaching those groups that don't have access to the internet. Uh, and, and so I, I would encourage the government to, to look at different kinds of digital solutions and not only focus on internet based ones or data based solutions, but also see can it be a multi-channel approach? Can you use both apps and internet plus IVR and SMS and other kinds of channels that would allow those that don't have that connectivity currently at least, um, allow them to also access it. 
while also those that do have connectivity can, can access those more high-tech uh, solutions as well. So it doesn't have to be one high-tech or low-tech, it can be a combination and a multi-channel approach to reach people across their digital literacy. Yeah, thank you so much, Alice. And I think uh, the the point raised by uh, Darwin Flores of SMART that, uh, of course, digital literacy is still uh, very much an issue, in, especially in the Philippines. And um, I mean, the, the receptive level of the farmers are still uh, low. So I think uh, my question would be um, um, jumping from that uh, from that point. So um, what's your experience in helping or empowering farmers to shift to digital technology? So from your experience, what's, what's their receptive level in the innovations that you offer? Are they very much open to, uh, to use uh, the technology? Uh, Pratif, do you have, uh, do you want to respond? <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Uh, so to, to be honest, uh, uh, we have, since we don't work directly with farmers, uh, we work with, uh, you know, insurance banks and uh, public sector. Uh, even, uh, even with the field staff of these organizations, we have uh, had challenges of, uh, you know, improving the, the, the usability or, or changing the complete design of the product itself. So uh, one thing which, and this is coming from experience, not just in Philippines, but other countries, is that uh, uh, the, the user research uh, and cultural contextualization part is very important. Um, and we have to also know what kind of uh, uh, smartphones uh, are being used. Like there is a lot of survey required. You can't design something that will work on certain type of smartphone, you know, processor wise, speed wise, and then uh, uh, ex expect that uh, everyone will be able to use your uh, app seamlessly. So uh, there is there is some level of uh, research which is also I think required uh, on on uh, these things. Uh, and uh, uh, we have from an Indian perspective, we have seen a tremendous digital uh, technology penetration. I mean, uh, seven, eight years back, we couldn't uh, uh, imagine people in the rural areas, farmers uh, using a smartphone and uh, taking uh, you know advisories from some application provider. But uh, they do that. They use it to sell, to buy, and uh, they are using nowadays uh, the, the the payment gateways to make their uh, uh, you know uh, do their transactions. So that trans transformation happened because of multiple reasons. The transformation happened because the telecom companies penetrated very fast in India because it's a big population, so big market for them. Uh, and, and that has to be facilitated through government policies, uh, government policies on uh, both telecom and information uh, <coughs> broadcasting. Number two is uh, the overall ecosystem of uh, uh, tech in India was uh, quite, quite strong, which is why, which latched on to this, uh, you know, infrastructure creation that helps them to connect with farmers. Uh, and uh, uh, in the Philippines context, I, this goes to the previous question that was asked on connectivity. I, I feel that uh, uh, there should be a, a mixed approach uh, of uh, if uh, if we are uh, looking at connecting all the people, it can may not necessarily be through always terrestrial. Uh, today, Starlink from SpaceX uh, is providing mm -hmm. 300 Mbps, uh, uh, you know, data speeds in uh, mm -hmm. remote parts of Australia. So, uh, this, if if the regulatory approval can be given for a service like Starlink from Elon Musk, uh, Philippines uh, uh, and it's let's say you know funded by the government uh, in some ways, you, you can actually enable connectivity in a very very short time pan uh, across all the islands there. So. It's a combination of everything. Mm -hmm. It's a combination of user, government, policy, willingness, everything, which which leads to this. Yeah, thank you so much, Pratib. And I agree that uh, it's very much uh, complex than we uh, we can imagine. No, so yeah, um, JP, do you want to uh, respond to uh, the questions uh, posed? I think that's where the advantage, VJ, of working with organized smallholder farmers is actually coming to the picture. Um, in Mayani's experience, we've seen that farmers who actually organize themselves in cooperatives or farmers associations, that brings them to a certain level of organizational knowledge, right? So the, the learning curve and the adoption curve isn't that steep 
when they work together and they form associations. So that made it easier for us to actually check whether these farm cooperatives are able to share to us their crop production plans. Um, these farm, farmers associations are able to do it in a very in a digital manner, right? Um, so I think we would like to encourage the, the creation of more farm cooperatives, grassroots organizations, and for these smaller farmers to organize themselves. Because having having a peer uh, who, who shares your interest, in this case, you know, uh, coming from a common background, a common ethnicity, right, a common province, and a geography, actually facilitates peer-to-peer -peer learning, right? Um, Where in, if you're just work vis -vis, if you're just working alone, it's definitely harder, and you're going to be more challenged when it comes to adopting to digital solutions, as opposed to you working with like 200 members of the same cooperative, of which you're also a member of. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, JT, and I agree that, uh, you know, uh, farm clustering and cooperativizing the, far the smallholder farmers, the individual farmers into groups is um, uh, very much an important, uh, you know, step in uh, um, achieving scale, you know. So, um, Felix, do you want to, do you have any additional input? Yeah, I, I think, uh, because for us, uh, we, we have a, like an actual uh, grassroots experience so uh, you, you just have to be creative I think depending on the community so uh, for us at Comunidad we have uh, guys that are uh, in social development uh, uh, community development so we understand uh, you know how the community works how do they think uh, sometimes we have apps that are written in Tagalog uh, you know it, it just depends on how you want to interpret the data but I agree with JT that uh, based from our experience it's uh, it's better to give like uh, the system to let's say a co-op or to a barangay hall rather than uh, every individual farmer. So they feel that going to the barangay hall is much better. Like they feel more assured, like, oh, okay, mm -hmm. the weather now is uh, in six hours, compared to having it delivered to, uh, to them directly. So uh, we, I just noticed that kind of pattern. So, but uh, you can be creative in terms of, you know, interpreting the, uh, the app. I think mostly uh, for, since for us, we're a Bicolano Filipino company, we can really, uh, you know, really creative in terms of understanding really, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the needs. Uh, we can do it in Tagalog, we can do it in Bicol, you know, we can do it in, uh, you know, whatever it is, you know, it, it, it can be done. So if you're really serious in just, let's say, tapping one community and making it work. So I think we have lots of organizations now that are funding a lot of communities. So it's just more of additional effort, probably, like, you know, just uh, you go beyond uh, at least if you go beyond uh, and then for the sake of the community, at least you can, uh, you know, you can make them yeah. really adapt to the system. So it's not really a, a question of, uh, you know, uh, what you call this uh, digital literacy or, you know, it's just more how you really implement it on a grassroots approach and on a tech mm -hmm. approach. You know, binding the two would be. Yeah. yeah, but it's challenging. It's challenging. <laughs> yeah, I agree on, on that end. Yeah, creativity is the key. And of course, uh, you know, it's also helpful to uh, customize uh, your technology or the app based on the, of course, for example, the local language or the local uh, culture. And of course, the receptivity receptivity level of the smallholder farmers. So um, I just uh, checked the time. We have another uh, speakers here, Miss Dory. So, uh, but there are a lot of questions that are directed to our uh, each of the individual uh, speakers that we have here. So um, apologies that we will be uh, cutting the moderated discussion earlier and we will just send all the speakers uh, I mean the questions to all our speakers here and we will let them, you know, um, respond and then we will uh, send the um, responses to all our uh, participants. So thank you so much, uh, Alice, uh, Patip, uh, JT and Felix for uh, for responding to the uh, questions. And of course, thank you so much for, for your time in this uh, session. So um, moving on, we're going back to the presentation of uh, Ms. Dory of uh, DOST Picard, uh, ma'am, to, uh, to continue the, the presentation. Over to you, ma'am. Okay, thank you. I hope you can hear me now. Yes, ma'am. Uh, loud and clear, ma'am. Yes, okay. ma'am. <laughs> that's, that's good. Okay, so I'll be presenting our uh, for the Department of Science and Technology. I hope... This is our opportunity for Picard to be introduced into a wider 
sector of the society. This is a good venue, a good uh, for exchanging information. And I think uh, being the last, I think our portion it will be somehow a little bit different. I hope this will be of interest to you. So uh, for a DOST, the Department of Science and Technology, and then Picard, we say we are towards digital agriculture. Next slide, please. So for the outline of this presentation, first, we will have the status when it comes to uh, digital agriculture in the Philippines. And then what are the benefits of digital agriculture and what has been done by the Department of Science and Technology towards digital agriculture? And lastly, where do we go? So give, uh, please allow me first to introduce, this is now our promotion, what is the OS Picard? The uh, Picard is the Philippine Council for Agriculture, Aquatic and Natural Resources Research and Development. So being the DOST, we are only one of the sectoral council under the Department of Science and Technology. And Picard is engaged in active partnership with international, regional, and national organization. And we are also funding institution for joint R&D. We, we also have activities towards human resource development and training, technical assistance. We have also the exchange of scientists, exchange of information, and more. We are into the innovation and technologies. So Picard, next slide, please. The council is implementing its program through R&D, and we have extension consortia. So meaning in the Philippines, we have regional consortia. We are located all over the country. So from uh, the region Cordillera until in the regions in Mindanao. So you can find Picard in different areas of the country. We also support the National Agriculture, Aquatic and Natural Resources Research and Development Network. So we have a partnership in the region. And in this case, there are national uh, multi, and then we also have single commodity regional R&D centers. We have cooperating st uh, stations, and we also have specialized agencies. So in terms of mandate, this is, these are our four mandates. In terms of formulation of policies, plans, projects, and strategies for S&T development. Also, we are uh, mandated to allocate government and external funds for R&D. And then, of course, being in the R&D, we monitor projects and we also generate external funds for the R&D activities. So I would like to introduce that at Picard, we have the technical research divisions. Um, PPSA mentioned about the commodities. So at Picard, we have crops, livestock, aquatic, marine, and then forestry. So I think in terms of priorities, most of the com uh, commodities uh, fall under crops based on what we heard this afternoon. And to also balance, we have cross-cutting, we have the socioeconomics, and then the technology promotion division. We have the agriculture resources management, we are the division in charge for digital agriculture. And considering marketing policies, value chain analysis, we have the social economics, and we also have the technology promotion uh, where we have the technology commercialization aspect and also the knowledge management. So meaning when it comes to a partnership, you can name what you want in terms of partnership with Picard. Next slide, please. So I will be focusing more on our division. Uh, for the last years, on our DP card, we have conference on smart farming R&D. And this was attend by, attended by the different sectors of the society. 
and this was attended by more than 100. Of course, to do r and proposals, we train our researchers on the packaging of r and projects. And for engaging into sharing our experts and involving them with the international, we have the ex uh, science exchange mission. And we have uh, several uh, exchange mission on digital agriculture and more for smart farming in general. For international workshop, we have also activities or partnership with FFTC and the Asian Productivity Organization where we send our researchers for the activities for exchange. Next slide, please. Okay, digital agriculture for us, it refers to the use of new and advanced technologies integrated into one system to enable farmers and stakeholders within the agriculture value chain to improve our food production. So for the available technologies to the farmers in the Philippines, uh, we have sensors. So for sensors, we are, for example, we have to measure uh, the soil moisture. So we have sensors on this aspect. We have so, uh, specialized software solutions that target specific farm type, uh, types or use case agnostic IoT platforms. And we have data analytics and uh, other technologies. Uh, next slide, please. Of course, to increase product uh, efficiency, we have robotic. We're in, in this case, we have autonomous tractors for speedy uh, cultivation in the farm. And then we also have to robotize because we need to do the efficient and productive way of producing our crops in the farm. Next. Of course, we have GPS satellite. This was mentioned by some of our speakers. And then of course, in terms of connectivity, here comes our digital. We have the cellular, LoRa, and others. Next slide, please. Okay, when it comes to maturity, uh, in the Philippines, uh, we have uh, the different techniques. In this case, we have hydroponics, RGP uh, feedstocks, and then bioplastics. Hydroponics has been going, uh, growing, uh, moving on in the Philippines. And we have different uh, scale from small to medium and large scale hydroponics. And then for new technologies to bring food, La Luna for this uh, pandemic, we try to promote vertical and urban farming. So this is where the OSD is putting uh, funds to support people in the urban communities with the urban farming, especially the Gulayan sa Pamayanan. And then uh, this is where our digital agriculture uh, comes in. We have the technologies on drones, data analytics, and IoT, and precision agriculture. Next slide, please. So in Southeast Asia, the active digital agriculture services by use case in Southeast Asia, we have in Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, and then Indonesia. Next slide, please. Can we move on to Dana? Because I have so many slides. Okay, so I will emphasize on this. So in the Philippines, these are all the big challenges that we are facing. We are prone to national hazards. And then when it comes to mechanization, while we have programs and projects, still we have to move on because mechanization is still lagging behind. And of course, this is the main problem. We are growing and doubling in terms of population. And there is rapid urbanization. And what is the big problem as of now is more on our sources, 
we have environmental degradation and how do we address all these challenges? We need to go to the integration of digital technology. So we go digital and this is where we should go together so that we can move into agriculture 4.0 this time. Next slide, please. So now for agriculture to move on, we have to go to agriculture 4.0. How? First, it's through the IoT, which will combine all machines and devices to create a data-driven agriculture sector. And more, we have to automate so that we'll be able to lighten the physical burden involved in our traditional farming practices. Chatbots, so that we'll be able to provide answers and recommendation to farmers for specific day-to-day -day problems. So this is very important. And then of course, drones. We do the production using drones this time. So we have to move on by making our production using spray and uh, spray for spraying and then for analyzing the soil pro uh, properties and then monitoring what's happening at the farm level when it comes to the growth of our crops and even for facilitate, facilitating irrigation and fertilizer, uh, fertilizer application. Component of agriculture 4.0, of course, is the blockchain and of the importance of the financial network to make our agriculture more efficient and we have to be more robust and secure as well as allow for more efficient book, uh, bookkeeping. Another, being in the science and technology, we do the nanotechnology that will allow farming practices to be more precise. We introduce machines to facilitate crop fertilization and then for protection and analysis. And lastly, to allow our farmers to form networks. This is very important so that they can share resources and surplus through technology, which does reduce the waste. Next slide. Okay, this is the way for us to move on with digital agriculture. We have to promote the benefits. What is the importance of this digital agriculture? In the farm level, it will really help improve the farm management and decision making. And then uh, at the industry level, it will have a flow and effects on farm efficiency and optimize along the supply chain, if improve the industry decision making, and of course, in terms of quality control and assurance. And this is the step towards a change in the agriculture industry. Next slide, please. Okay, the role of ICTs in agriculture. This is where we should do our task. So we have to integrate or bind ourselves together, looking at the regulatory frameworks, meaning uh, ICTs to assist in implementing the regulatory policies or frameworks and ways to monitor progress in digital agriculture. We have to capacitate our manpower, empower people towards digital agriculture and of course, uh, the financial services. This has been mentioned by our farmer, uh, by former spe uh, speakers. And important, of course, is our food safety. This is very important this time, looking at the health of the populace. And to do that, we have to bridge the gap between agriculture researchers academia, extension agents, and farmers. So we have to uh, address a strong link in terms of research and extension. We have to do ICT in, for su sustainable farming. And moreover, in this time of you know, so many hazards, we look or consider the disaster risk management and the early warning system. ICT will provide information to the communities and government. 
it will gu guide and give warning for the people to address hazards. And lastly, we need an enhanced market access. What will be the, uh, done if we have more produce, but there's no market? So we have to facilitate market access for our inputs and products as well. Next slide, please. Oh, what has been done by, by Picard in terms of R&D? So I think this will be of interest to many, especially for our private sector who would like to venture on a business using the technologies that has been developed. By the way, uh, the OST has programs with the private sector uh, for them to also look at these technologies as a venture. So one technology that we have developed through our uh, universities and our uh, implementing agencies, we have sensor. And in this case, quality sensor for cacao beans. In this case, we have Filmet as our implementing agency for the development of this sensor. And another is the prototype of the nanobio sensor for detection of diseases. This is very important in this time because of the prevalence of diseases in most of our crops. Next slide, please. Of course, very important in this time for us to be competent, comp our product to be competitive. We have to automate. And one uh, project that we have before uh, is the development of the near infrared in spectroscopy. This is for food and feed quality, food quality and safety. So this was done through Cavite State University. Next slide, please. And then uh, for the livestock, for the product, eggs, uh, we have the balut vending machine. So it's easy, like the soft drinks, there is a vending machine. Next slide, please. Uh, another project funded by USTP card, we have the dehydrator machine for herbal tea materials. This is very important because it's difficult to dry our food products. So we have for herbal tea materials and this was done by the Iloilo Ilo Ilo State Agriculture University. Another is the Automated combined mechanical demosilager fermenter dryer, also for cacao. So this was done uh, through the University of Southeastern Philippines in Mindanao. Next slide, please. Another for automation. Uh, this was done by the University of Santa Tomas, the autonomous navigation system platform in hand tractor. So this is most appreciated by our farmer, easy to operate. Another, next slide, please. Okay, for automation, this is for the sugar cane. We have the automated for irrigation system. This is an option to facilitate precision uh, irrigation. So for irrigation in sugar cane production using Paro irrigation, subsurface irrigation to increase the sugarcane productivity. So this is uh, a project that was uh, implemented through the Central Luzon State University. And we are promoting the use of this automated paro irrigation system. Next slide, please. Okay, for production of different crops, using the smarter greenhouse. So this uh, is a very important uh, technology in this time that we have to develop uh, to, to grow more food using smarter greenhouse. Next slide, please. Okay, another project that is very important in this time is the provision of tools and techniques decision support system that will enable us to map out. This will be used for by the policy making body. 
So this uh, resource mechanization mapping was done in re uh, was implemented by UPLB um, in region six and region four. So this is also for use of our policymaker. And this uh, technology is also for sharing with others, although this is not yet to, uh, fully finished, but we have to share this because this is an important project that we can share to you as well. Next, next slide, please. We also have the Demeter's eyes. This is an embedded system for smart detection, recognition, and mapping of this uh, phytoplasma disease which is Bloom Sakasaba. So this is also a decision support system. And uh, this was done or implemented by the Isabella State University. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, I'm not sure, but this was also promoted in several venues. This is uh, the Rosana Banana Disease Surveillance System. This is a very important um, tool because we really have to monitor the prevalence of disease in the banana plantation. So this was developed by the University of Southeastern Philippines um, by Dr. Valkimno. And for those uh, private sector who might be interested about this uh, decision si uh, support system, you can uh, get some more details about this Rosanna. Another is uh, for onion and garlic. Just like uh, the previous project, this tool is also very important, but this is more on the onion and garlic in the Nueva Ecija. So same, this is uh, very important for our decision-making uh, decision makers and even for the local government unit in order to prevent uh, the damages of this anthracnose nose in the onion and garlic production areas. Next slide, please. Miss Dolly, sorry po. Um, we are hoping if you could ano po, wrap up the uh, presentation, okay, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. Okay, now Sarai. Uh, for Sarai, well, we are promoting this uh, too many and this has been promoted in different programs various uh, form. This is an important uh, program and I think we we have to share this information to more uh, or a wider sector of our audience. So next, uh, next slide, please. Another, uh, for Sarai, um, these uh, are the tools that are very important for our farmers, and this was uh, um, developed for different crops. So for more details, you can contact UPLB. Our program leader is Dr. Vicky Espaldon. Next slide, please. So also for Sarai, uh, we have the community level, uh, Sarai Enhanced Agriculture Monitoring System and Dissemination, and we call it SIMS. So this is also very important, and I think uh, this should be shared to our uh, partners. And we also wanted that this also be shared to your area of coverage. Next slide. Okay, we are also under the Sarai technology, we have WAIS. WAIS is a smart monitoring and decision platform that can provide farmers and crop growers a science and database approach. This is more on irrigation. Next slide, please. And then we have uh, the CAF. This is very important considering drought in our, that we are experiencing in the country. The CAF, it detects, monitors, and forecasts drought events and stress in agriculture areas. Next slide. Okay, for more information, we have the Sarai Knowledge Portal. Uh, we, I would like to share and hope you can access this. Uh, in, the more information that you can get from this portal. Next slide, please. So this is also for Sarai and we have for Banana Tech. I think 
uh, for those uh, who are engaging or on the commodity of banana, please uh, do uh, search in our Sarai portal for this information. Next slide. So for speed tech, it's usability and accept acceptability assessment by cacao farmers in Akerlang. So meaning our tool are already in the farmer's level and its usability and acceptability was assessed in Laguna and Cavite. So I, uh, the results, I think we, that's why we are promoting because the farmers already are already in the process and they wanted the information that we shared through the speed tech. Next slide. Also for Ma'am. Okay. Next. Me, Ma'am. Okay. Uh, let's go to the way forward. Okay, pass. Okay. Okay. So when it comes to where do we go? Or where are we? And where do we go? There are already programs regarding modernizing or making agriculture digital or precise or smart. But still, there are lots to be done for the Philippines to achieve agriculture 4.0. So for Philippines, we have to move on. Maganda at we have this venue. Our partnership will help us go higher and be at the digital level. So with the experts that we have in our agriculture for digital agriculture, we have several, and some of them can do mentor our young generation because we believe the young people, they are more enticed to digital agriculture, smart agriculture, and this is the way to go, involve the different stakeholders by bringing also the young farmers. I think I have to end our, uh, my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. All right. Thank you so much, Ms. Dory, for that uh, presentation. And uh, we see that DOST Picard has uh, a lot um, uh, initiatives and programs that you have done for uh, to achieve uh, digital agriculture in the country. And uh, thank you so much for and to, uh, to for the questions uh, to you. In the interest of time, we will just send uh, to uh, to you the questions. Uh, we, uh, posed by our participants and uh, of course we will send uh, your respond your, your response to uh, to everyone so thank you so much for uh, miss Dory for that presentation again and to our participants apologies for uh, running over the time and uh, just to um, finish or uh, conclude this um, webinar session we have uh, a poll that's going to uh, uh, launch um, to know our or uh, please help us uh, what's the next online learning activity or topics would be useful to you so uh, the poll is I think uh, has been launched now and I we want you to choose from among the uh, topics that uh, we, you would like us uh, to tackle in our uh, succeeding uh, webinar session. So you can uh, choose um, more than one uh, suggested topics. So I'm giving you around, again, 10 to 15 seconds uh, to uh, please help us uh, think of uh, the next uh, topics that we will um, discuss in our uh, succeeding webinar sessions. Okay, so I think that's um, already uh, fine. We have uh, gathered a lot, um, a lot of responses to our participants. So I'll end the poll. So as you can see, uh, there are a lot, as mentioned by our speakers uh, previously, that uh, a clustering of uh, farmers or individual farmers are, is very much important in uh, in every aspect of uh, agriculture sector in the country. So um, more participants are uh, wanting to uh, have a discussion on cooperative development and strengthening and of course uh, agricultural research and 
another equally important uh, component in agricultural development. And we also have precision agriculture, climate, smart farm production, and of course, also women and gender in agriculture. All right, uh, thank you so much for uh, participating in our poll and this uh, final poll that's um, uh, that we have here. Uh, we just want to uh, know your feedback feedback for today's session. So how useful did you find this webinar? So it's very useful, mostly useful, um, you know, somewhat useful, fairly useful, and hmm, not at all useful. All right, I'm giving another uh, 10 to 15 seconds for our participants to respond to the poll. All right, I think that's um, enough. So yeah, again, uh, thank you so much to uh, to everyone, especially to our speakers, uh, Director uh, Padre, uh, Miss Derby, uh, Alice, uh, Felix, uh, uh, JT, and Pati for uh, gracing our event, and of, of course for sharing uh, with uh, us your technology and of course your initiatives in pushing for uh, digital agriculture in the Philippines and of course across Asia and the world. So thank you so much again and we hope to see you in our uh, next uh, webinar sessions in the future. And uh, I hope we uh, uh, keep uh, stay in touch and of course we will send the uh, recordings uh, of the uh, sessions to everyone through our YouTube and Spotify podcast channels. So again, thank you so much and uh, keep safe everyone and of course keep COVID free. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank you everyone. Thank you.